Hello and welcome to Public Affairs, Public Access on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Linda Cohn with the League of Women Voters, and tonight we are lifting up our eyes and looking toward the heavens, and we are going to talk about what it means to be a human being in these, our early days, as a spacefaring species. What does this have to do with the League of Women Voters? A little history. Follow along with me. 98 years ago, on August 26, 1920, the United States Secretary of State, a man by the name of Bainbridge Colby, signed a certificate of ratification proclaiming that the 19th Amendment, the Women's Suffrage Amendment, had indeed been properly ratified by the required three quarters of the states and was from that moment forward a part of our Constitution. American women at last had secured the right to vote. August 26th is commemorated each year as Women's Equality Day. And we at the League of Women Voters like to kick up our heels a little bit in celebration. So we have a little party and we like to talk about the legacy and the promise of Amendment 19. The idea that all human beings working together can pave a path toward a more happy future across all magisteria of human accomplishment, including the arts, government, and the life sciences too, and the physical sciences. For Women's Equality Day 2018, we decided to focus on science and technology, with a special salute, being the good Houstonians that we are, to astronomy and spaceflight, because as everyone knows, Houston is the home of the great adventure known as manned spaceflight. Please call us with your questions or comments. We'd love to hear from you and learn your point of view. The number is 713-807-1794. That's 713-807-1794. With us this evening from the University of Houston downtown, history professor, Dr. Jean Price. Also from the University of Houston downtown, Professor of Military History, Dr. Alexander Bielankowski. And from the Houston Museum of Natural Science, Vice President for Astronomy, Dr. Carolyn Sumners. And one more from our sister civic organization, Mi Familia Vota, we welcome Vanessa Perez, a Mi Familia Vota youth leader. Before we get started, Vanessa, please tell us just a little bit about Mi Familia Vota and their youth leader program. You're a high school student. Yes, yes. So I am a rising, or I am a senior at DeBakey High School. Um, and through Mi Familia Vota, um, we strive to empower other youth to be politically active and engage in their civic duty. And so uh, whether that be holding a youth summit or whether that be going door to door, just educating everyone on their voice and their right to vote is something that we do as Mi Familia Vota and just within our community to empower not just Latinos but everyone um, to engage in their right to vote. Now, with Debakey High School is a special high school, is it not? Yes, It has yes. a special focus. Tell us a little yes, bit. Yes, it is. Um, Debakey High School has a focus in medical health professions, so it is a STEM school and what um, as juniors and seniors get to do is they get to go on rotations um, half of their day and get to experience firsthand what it is to be in the hospitals and working one-on-one -on -one with patients. Where did your field work take you this past semester? This past semester, I was able to work at PICU, so that's the um, children's ICU unit at uh, Memorial Hermann, so that's what I was able to undergo this semester. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to abandon every shred of decorum and decency and show you something from my personal scrapbook. Uh, uh, 1959. Let's see if I can, I can find the, uh, there we go, there it is. 1959, America was a little bit frantic because just two years earlier, our nemesis, then known as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, had done something rather extraordinary. It had launched the first artificial satellite into orbit 
which was kind of pretty scary. Jean Price, tell us about that time and that place. And why were we all wringing our hands so nervously to the extent that Future Scientists of America, an interesting program for third graders, was launched? Well, trying it, to make science attractive. Why did we need scientists so desperate? Well, you know, when I grew up, and I grew up in a little town northeast of New Braunfels, uh, New Braunfels, uh, northeast of San Antonio, New Braunfels, and. Um, when I was in school, we had all these drills where we would go out in the hall and we would practice what most people today would call duck and cover, you know, that, that cartoon. Uh, and we would, you know, because we were preparing for the day, if it should come, that we would be under military attack from Russia. Because we were close to San Antonio, a big military city, we figured, of course, we were going to be a prime target. I think every town. Uh, must have felt that away. Uh, and I don't think people today realize how frightened we were of another war. My dad served in World War II. And just a generation before him, his father served in World War I. So we today don't grow up with that environment. So young people today don't have that. Uh, I mean, when I was young, there was still Vietnam. So this idea of what we called a Cold War at that time, uh, was fresh on everyone's mind, and our biggest competitor, the two countries that emerged from World War II as the superpowers, were the United States and the Soviet Union. And we were deadlocked in a heated competition, economically, culturally, and uh, militarily, of course, politically as well, too. So uh, in 57, when Sputnik 1 launched, uh, Americans were frightened because what that meant was that the Soviet Union had beat us into space. So that little, you know, if you've ever seen a, a, a copy of that or a, a model of that, it's about the size, I like to say, of a beach ball with some antenna coming out the back end. And, you know, it just circled the Earth several times and emitted some beeps, some, you know, beep, Musical beep, beeps, beeps, too. Do you remember that? And, well, it's a little bit before my time, but... You remember I, stories, though. I, I, but I've heard it. I mean, there's recordings that you yeah. can get on YouTube and on the and Internet. And they were not playing the Star Spangled Banner, no, were they? they were not. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, this was very frightening because if they had command of space, then what was to stop them from launching a missile? Now, we had seen their rocket program in World War II, and, and Alex can talk more about this than I can, but their rocket program in World War II that had launched a rocket ship under Werner von Braun, their rocket scientists, had launched a rocket ship over 200 miles from Germany over to London, and they were bombing London. And so what would happen next? Where would the next missile go? Now they could reach us if they could get into suborbit. So that was, that moved everything. I'm an educational historian by, by practice. So I study the development of, of schools. And Sputnik 1 launched the STEM programs, really. Our fascination, our emphasis on STEM. So it changed the world completely. Alex, you are the military and historian at the table today. Remind us about the closing days of World War II when the German scientists at Penamundu, who had been so outrageously successful, were being pulled apart by the Americans at one hand and the Russians at the other, that Russia and America were allies at the time, knowing that there would be a time beyond World War II right. when they would not be allies a and that technology was needed. Tell us a little bit about that. That in itself is a fascinating story. Yeah, there's, story. there's basically a feeding frenzy for German scientists <laughs> at the end of uh, World War II in every uh, area of scientific endeavor. I mean, not, not just rocketry, uh, though rocketry becomes uh, obviously one of the most famous. And uh, the United States has something called Operation Paperclip. And Operation Paperclip is the code name for our efforts to grab all of the scientists, especially scientists involved with the nuclear weapons program or with rocketry because we're already anticipating where the world is going to be in, you know, in five years or ten years down the road. And so it is this, this feeding frenzy. We're trying to get them. They're trying to get them. Um, we are using a little more enticements in the sense that 
we're saying, hey, you come to America, we're going to get you citizenship, we're going to give you a job, you know, so forth and so on, things are going to be good for you. The Soviets, on the other hand, are, are usually using the, we're going to hold your wife and children hostage, and so you're going to come work for us. Um, and, and so that, that kind of sets up the whole tone for what happens afterward. Um, and, and then the, the whole joke in, in throughout the Cold War is, you know, we, we got the good Nazis. So all the, you know, Werner von Braun and all these other guys become good Nazis because they're with us. Whereas the bad Nazis are the guys who go with the Soviets. That's the, that's the big joke in the Cold War. You know, we're talking a lot about STEM education. Let me ask you to go back even a few more years. Why were the Germans so horrifically successful? What was there in their educational landscape that made it possible for scientists to be so darn successful when it came to space flight? Well, I'll say a few words, and I think I'll probably ask Gene to <clears throat> contribute because sure. he's the education uh, expert. But certainly, starting in the 19th century, the Germans have a very rigorous public school system that emphasizes hard subjects like uh, what we would call STEM today, uh, science, technology, those sorts of things. And uh, the Germans are known in the, in, from about the mid-19th century onward as the kind of the home of some of the major innovations in science and technology. Uh, I, I mean, names that we don't think of as German, like Bayer, like Bayer Aspirin, yeah. that's a German company. Uh, and so many of these other companies that are kind of byword uh, names for, for commodities and, and products we buy today were originally German companies. And so that whole system that they had set up feeds right into the Nazi era, and unfortunately, the Nazis are able to capitalize on it, even though most of the scientists themselves are, are not Nazis or not Nazi party members, for the most part. A few are. And in uh, fact, some cases were forced to leave Nazi occupied. Right, and, right. And then, of course, not... all the Jewish, German Jewish scientists have already fled by the time the war breaks out. Um, so the Germans, ironically, you know, cut off their, their nose to spite their face in that case. I mean, they got rid of quite a few of their best scientists, including Albert Einstein, because, of course, they were Jewish. Uh, but the still what they had left, the rump of what they had left of scientists, were, were just an amazing bunch. And, and Gene, maybe you could speak to the whole education aspect there. Well, <clears throat> let, me, let me start off by saying something. And this is going to sound, and actually your, your phone lines may r r light up over this, but I'm going to say this because this is what they said. Hitler knew the scientists in Germany were onto things, and they knew that they were making a lot of progress. Uh, and we did too, because scientists, like academics, like uh, uh, you know, most of us, is you know, they were writing things in journals and publishing them in journals, so it really wasn't a secret. But Hitler said, I don't want Jew science. Yes. I don't want Jew it. science. And he was a racist, obviously. And um, so he d tended to dismiss a lot of the very, a lot of the advanced ideas that a lot of the scientists had put forward because they were Jewish. So I always think it's kind of, uh, you know, we say, why did Germany have so much technology? It's almost, it's all, that's a really good question because they almost didn't because they had put such a, a, a clamp on it uh, in, the, in, the, in the 30s when he took power in 32. But, and, and let me also say this. We talk about, you know, weapons and stuff. Jap Japan also had some pretty advanced weaponry, too, but the government wasn't funding it at the time. So, you know, there's a, a story of, uh, you know, these Japanese scientists who are writing letters to the government saying, you know, hey, you know, like for nuclear weapons, that they were on to the atomic weapons and, and whatnot, but they had no money for the lab. And so, you know, pictures of a scientist sitting in a lab that's empty, with, un, unfunded, and they could have done so. So, I, I, you know, so, you know, we talk about rockets, very important, but also the atomic weaponry that was being developed, which could have really changed history. Uh, had the Germans been more uh, interested in promoting that or the Japanese had been more interested in promoting it. But back to the rockets. Um, you know, we had been developing rockets, and actually Goddard, yep. uh, Robert, Goddard. Robert Goddard, who didn't apparently get along with a lot of people, and so they stuck him off in New Mexico, kind of out of the way. Here, here's some money, here's a lab, do your own thing, just leave us alone. Um, they put him over there, but he had made quite a few leaps. Uh, von Braun uh, in Germany and others had made leaps. And so they saw the potential of rocket power. And, the, and the, uh, of course, the Germans took that for the military. Uh, 
we, we talk about you're talking about uh, von Braun being the good Nazi. You know, he always said, "Well, I didn't send rockets because I wanted to. I sent rockets uh, because I had to," um, and, and you know, and bombed London. But it, it, the the educational import and the education of Germany is you would a lot of our college today were built upon a German model, uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s, because the Germans were excelling. But when Hitler came in, he really kind of set them back a little bit, and it's kind of surprising that they, you know, focused on what they did and were able to to really advance rocketry beyond what Goddard had 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 done. Mm. Two side notes, my good friend Dale Gorzinski at a previous Women's Equality Day celebration once told me that the history of science in the 20th century was written in broken English <laughs> in deference to all those who came in. And Werner von Braun, having contributed so greatly to the American space program over the years, wrote a biography, an autobiography, I Aim at the Stars, to which the snarky tagline was, yeah, but my, my first efforts fell a little bit short, like Trafalgar Square. Right. <laughs> so with that, I take you to Carolyn Sumners, <laughs> who is the curator of astronomy at the Houston Museum of Natural Science. Has it been your observation, Dr. Sumners, that only the government is big enough and organized enough to do these amazing, huge projects, well, big science? I hope not. <laughs> I mean, we go back to Kennedy, and of course Kennedy was here in 62, and we're going to go to the moon, we are going to do it, and that was totally a political stunt. Well, probably not totally. He thought it was kind of a cool idea, I'm sure. And what was impressive is that once Americans kick it into gear and put the money behind it, and all those young people in mission control, you can find tons of mission controllers now from Apollo, because they were so young. And, you know, they had the equivalent of, of an Apple II, <laughs> to figure out how to do this. I had no computer power at all and actually figured out. I mean, I, the, the test pilots who flew, they were doing something that no one had ever done before and off they went. And they had stages and they hoped the stages would ignite. And it was just amazing. And when you back up and look at it and how careful we are now and how gutsy we were to get to the moon by 1969, and it has been exactly 50 years ago. It was inspiring, it was romantic, it was a great adventure, America's new great adventure. Yeah, I think it was, It was. we beat you, Russia. You know, take well, that, that, Soviet that, Union. That's the thing. <laughs> this is a rallying point for everything that was good and decent about America. This was where we're going to, this was the nitty gritty. This was the point at which we were going to take something concrete, and so you think and they should have put the flag in the movie? I, I, I don't know. I'll confine myself to nasty comments about Nazi scientists. But where, I mean, what on earth, and, and literally on earth, can we do two superpowers locked in, a, in, in a, a, an ideological battle for sure? But at that time, we didn't know how it was going to end. It's so comfortable, so easy for us to say 20, 30 years on, ah, you know. But not really, not then, not when we were doing duck and cover. Well, it was nice that we did spend the money on the space program, on going to the moon, because A, we learned a lot about the moon, we learned a lot about ourselves and how much we could do, and we spent the money in the United States building all this stuff. So it was good for us technology-wise, too, and we got Velcro. What else and, and, Houston. <laughs> and Tang. And Tang. And, tang. Tang. and, and, and it was and, you know, built up Clear Lake. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, very there. close to home. Yeah, there was no Johnson Space Center at the yeah. time. So that was, and the, the property was owned by Rice University. Yes. How did, Rice sold it to it? the government. If the government ever decides they don't want it anymore, Rice thinks they aren't doing what they're supposed to do with it and take it back. <laughs> Does it take a threat? Does it traditionally, has it taken a threat? Like the threat of, of, of um, warfare, annihilation, mass casualties, to spark sure. science and technology? To really spark it. I mean, we, we really put the money in, put the pedal to the metal on the space program to go into the moon. And I think it's, we have only X amount of money to allocate. We have much less to allocate than we used to have. And I think that there's got to be more than just, hey, it'd be fun to know if they have it's like. It'd be kind of cool to be there. That's never going to get the level of funding from the public sector. It may, you may get private funders who launch their uh, cars into space. That, you <laughs> well, know, that, that's only been possible the in the last couple of years, though, has it? Has it's, well, well, it's because NASA's funding it. Basically, these private companies are doing it cheaper than NASA could, but NASA's putting the money in. 
So I think that we're still at the point of there's some government funding slipping through this thing, but we are, I, I'm very encouraged by SpaceX and, and, and all the different other ones that are coming you online. You think there's a place at the table for them. This is a departure from the model that we were discussing, the post world I think, I model. I think for t just technology that the private sector can probably do it better. Uh, and uh, I was asking somebody about a freeway, about they're going to drop the freeway down where I live. And they said, well, if, if the government does it, if TxDOT does it, it'll take eight years. If they hire it out to private contractors, it'll take three. And I think that's kind of what we're... What we're is is this the at. case only in the United States? Because we do have international partners now. Are other countries also developing private industry as I don't, a way to... I don't see it at the level that we are. I think it's unique. I think we all can comment. So once again, we'll be the I think it's somewhat unique to us. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say. I mean, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but you know, it's such a it's such a, a turnaround from the way it started. Of course, you know, in the in the Cold War after '57, all the push to better educate our students, um, to bring in STEM majors. Uh, and STEM fields into the classroom and to to really push that. But it was the government who did it because it was a military initiative when Kennedy, I mean, Kennedy was a Cold Warrior. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so this was a challenge to the Russians. Now, in, in fact, the Russians did beat us to the moon, right? They landed a rocket, well, they crashed a rocket. Yes. Uh, on the moon before we got there. So they actually got there before we did. They put animals into space before we did. Of course, they didn't come back. And by then uh, we caught up. And we and we were we were always second fiddle. Now we actually got, you know, in, in 69, July 20th, we landed two men on the moon while a third waited in the capsule behind. And that was tremendous. I've heard that more people, I mean, uh, you know, they were talking about how many people watch that on TV. Of course, you don't really know, but it was a worldwide television event. Probably that was the first time ever. I mean, television was new, right? Tele we didn't have television until the 50s. Can you believe that? No. Uh, <laughs> we didn't have smartphones. I, I, I interned at NASA, and uh, one of the things in the 90s, in 99, I inter interned at NASA at the, at, the, at the Oral History Program, the Space Program, History Program. And one of the things that they kept saying, uh, Gene Krantz and everybody else kept saying, is that, you know, the, this is 99, the computers in your car were more powerful than the computers that landed a man on the moon. Uh, they were still using slide rules. You don't know what that is, right? But they were using slide rules. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they were figuring it out. And so I said, I had to give an award to one of our math students uh, last year, and I said, you know, we're on a ball that's spinning and traveling in space. And we had to figure out how to get this spinning, traveling ball, get a ship launched up to go to another ball that's also spinning and traveling and going around us, and to land it at a specific spot. And they didn't have computers. And the computers that they had were hard, what they called hardwired in those days. Yeah. And if I don't know of anything that is more amazing that we were able to do that with the limited resources, and it was pretty much all guesswork. Oh, oh yeah, no video cameras either, right? It was all telemetry, and we were the, there was a delay in the sound, so it wasn't instantaneous communication. They were really on their own, yeah, and we at, didn't know. You were talking about uh, Earthrise, that famous uh, photograph of uh, of the Earth that uh, they they took on Apollo three. Apollo eight. Apollo eight. And it, you know, when, when the first time they went around the dark side of the moon, we really didn't know what was going to happen, and we had a, it was like an eight minute delay. LOS. Right. Lost the signal. Yeah. Before we knew that those people in that capsule were safe. And I think only the government could have done it then, but I think now because there's so much interest, um, for better or for worse, yeah. that now it's become the private companies. But, but the military built those private companies, right? Grumman, uh, all of those were contracted out, all those, the, man, yeah, the, the lunar module, the command capsule, the, the Saturn V, and even before that, those other rockets were all contracted out to World War II aircraft companies. Yep. 
yeah. in Dallas and in other places that built them and we helped build them in return. Which yeah. makes SpaceX a little different. Yeah. 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 So there was an intense uh, competition, just to reiterate, between the United States and the Soviet Union that extended from ideology to weaponry and each was quite intent on turning this into a publicity coup. Well, the uh, Soviets um, launched the first woman into space. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, as it turned out, I understand I she was protested. I want to go back to that one first. Oh, go. Okay. <laughs> back to Apollo 8. I just haven't quite left there yet. Um, I think that what came from Apollo 8, the astronauts were, were going over the moon in orbit, and somebody looked out the window and went, oh, there's the Earth. Never it occurred to them. It wasn't even on the photographic list to photograph the Earth. So give me the camera, give me the camera, grab the camera. And they got the black and white camera and they shot it and then the Earth was gone. And then they go, oh no, we had this gorgeous picture. And then the Earth appeared on another window. And so they grabbed the color camera and they shot and shot and shot and shot until the Earth was gone. And so they produced the equivalent of an Earth rise, which it really wasn't. The Earth doesn't rise and set on the moon. But anyway, that picture started Earth Day. We never, mm. in the middle of all of this conflict and all this chaos, we never saw the Earth alone in space without boundaries, all by itself, because if you're in low Earth orbit, you don't see the whole Earth, you see just a cord of it. So we never saw the whole Earth just sitting there all by itself and realized how precious the Earth is. And I think the whole Earth Day movement was based on that picture. And, uh, you know, the Apollo program actually launched it. Which well, yeah, because Earth Day was, what, 69 was the mm -hmm. first one? And so, yeah, you're, that's, that's a great tie-in. And, and, and me, in the middle of all this Russia mess and the Soviet Union yeah. mess and fighting with each other and fussing and everything else, we launched Earth Day. And it, it, uh, jumping ahead into the future a bit, wasn't outer space one of the first areas where the United States and the USSR and then it was the former USSR, showed some propensity for cooperation? I think, I think that is true. We did, remember Apollo Soyuz? We had an extra Apollo, what are we gonna do with it? The public doesn't care anymore if we go to the moon. So let's build a Skylab with part of the rocket and then let's dock up dock with the Soyuz and let's reach across and we'll shake hands. And, um, cause I, I was in Houston then, I remember I even got a press pass for Apollo Soyuz. And that was, that was cool because we didn't shake hands very often. And so to go above the Earth. Didn't shake hands very often on Earth, and this was the first yeah. collaboration in, in, right. in space. And of course, the ultimate irony is we've gone through Apollo, we've gone through shuttle, we've now, the only way we get into the, to space is that Soyuz <laughs> capsule that we shook hands on in the 1970s. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm going to ask our military historian was there a little bit of, of nervous hand wringing over sharing technology? Oh, absolutely, and, the, and there still is. I mean, the, the, you know, there's this this whole idea of, of proprietary technology, um, and there, this has never gone away, and this never will go away because it, it's it's at a level beyond even governments. It's corporations too. So you've got a you know you've got a double edged thing there because the corporations don't want their technologies shared with countries that, for instance, nowadays it's mostly China that don't honor international copyrights. And so they're not keen on that. Uh, and then you've got the, the military aspect of, of not wanting to share with other people. And, and I want to go back to one thing earlier you mentioned. You talked about governments and, and, and how technology evolves. I mean, one of the sad things about the 20th century is that when you look back, the greatest periods of in innovation, technological innovation, have unfortunately been during wars. I mean, you look at what, what an aircraft was in 1914 when World War I broke out. It was basically a box kite with an engine, okay? It, 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 you look at pictures of 1914, not 1918 aircraft, but 1914 aircraft, you can't believe these things take off, okay, that they can get airworthy. And by 1918, you're experimenting with mono-wing planes, you're exper experimenting with all-metal bodies, so you see that huge leap. And again, in World War II, you still have some countries using biplanes at the beginning of World War mm -hmm. II. And by the end of World War II, the British, the Americans, and the Germans all have jet aircraft. Okay? And so these, these huge bursts, these kind of almost generational bursts, can take place very, in very short spans if the government's willing to fund them. And the sad thing is, other than the space race, all these other major technological innovations have been because of war, because of a desire to win a conflict. 
And so it, it's sad that, yes, there's a Cold War, and of course, this, the space program is affected by that, but at least this one, the goal was a peaceful goal. I mean, that's one nice thing about the space program. Even there's people now who will talk about, oh gosh, it was a waste of money and, you know, and all this, but, but, but ultimately it was a peaceful goal. So yes, it's, did it cost a fortune? Absolutely. But it's not like building the atomic bomb, which ultimately, you know, results in death or jet aircraft, which, which of course to us is all about, you know, 747s and stuff, but in that era is about fighters and bombers. And we got Tang. Yeah, and we got and Tang. We, we, and Velcro. <laughs> and, <laughs> and possibly Teflon. I've heard many yes, different, that's true. I've heard that many one different too. stories about that. Okay, we're going to take a philosophical interlude here. And I'm going to ask the question, uh, went to the moon in 1969 and very quickly lost interest. Why? A couple of, of ideas? Too much going on on Earth? So you a strain know, there, of thought? There is a, a theory. <clears throat> I don't know how true this is, but when John Kennedy came to Rice University on that hot day <laughs> and said, we're going to go to the moon. In this decade. Because. Be yeah, be yeah. And do those other things, be not because they're easy. But because they're hard. But because they're hard. A so, national call to and so, arms. And, and so right after that, they came out with a TV show called Lost in Space. Right after that, they came out with a TV show called Star Trek. And in those, in, well, in, in, especially in Star Trek, I'm a Star Trek fan. It came out right before the, I was born. And, and I know other people are too. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this was it, it was it, it brought that took that that idea of international cooperation and even interspecies communication. You know, there was the intrepid Captain Kirk going out and and meeting all these uh, various other species, and uh, we were learning about their culture and exploring. And yet, when we went to the moon, there weren't any little green men, <laughs> right? There weren't, and so what's up there? Well, it's a big rock. And it, you know, it wasn't until recent, later on that we found out, oh, there's lots of minerals on that rock. It could be mined, but is it, is it too expensive? And so I, I think, I, I don't know if I buy that wholesale, but that is a, a, an argument is that people say, well, we didn't find any little green men or women uh, up there because uh, Captain Kirk liked green women. Yes, he did. But yeah. it's, it's even That's worse. True. I mean, <laughs> poor NASA has to live up to science fiction. Right. Yes. <laughs> and we don't do that very well, and I think that's one of the great of the great challenges. Well, well, where's the anti gravity room? You know, that's all. I want the my jetpack now. Yeah. Because and, with Houston and, traffic, and, and, I really need it. I would guess by by the mid by 1972 ish, everybody was believing. I mean, the books, all the books, like from Patrick Moore and all, believed we would be on Saturn, Saturn to the Titan. They had figured out all the places we could go, and they believed we'd just go there because this was really to the public eye, easy. We just, you know, one decade, we're there. Where are we gonna be the next decade? And it's, it's really impressive that everything just stopped. I think it's sad that we didn't think of making the moon uh, a satellite, making the moon instead of an ISS, but make the moon the permanent space station. Because all the satellite, all the stations have come down, Skylab's come down. Uh, ISS is coming down from metal fatigue, if nothing else. In, 10, 15 years. So, you know, if we, if we just build it all on the moon, it would be there. Now, we might decide we don't want to do there for, be there for a while, but it's not that much harder to get there because the moon, once the moon starts pulling you in, you're there. And it's, it's surprising. And I think that people didn't appreciate the moon for what it is, that if you, the whole history of the solar system is written on the moon. It's not on Mars. Mars has, Mars has had a tremendous amount of change, but the moon has had almost none. And every crater tells a story. And you can go back to the very beginning of the creation of the solar system in the remains of things on the moon. And, of course, the moon came from the Earth. The moon's our eighth continent. It spun off when an object the size of Mars hit the Earth and became part of the Earth, and lo and behold, out came the moon. And so uh, that makes the moon really kind of special. It's, not, it's, it's sterile. It's, it's Earth rock. I mean, you pick up the rocks. We show kids what the moon rocks look like. They're an orthocyte. They're, you know, brescia. They're right, because you don't pick them up in the Hawaii if you want to. Same rock, because the moon is of Earth. So 
is our extension into space, is our chance to practice, it is our proving ground that we can actually live out in space. I think the biggest shock that's come to people, and I guess it was predictable, but no one predicted it, because science fiction was so good, <laughs> that um, humans don't do this very well. Humans, the, the human body doesn't like change. Try to diet. You just starve to diet because the human body doesn't want to give up the fat. Human body doesn't want to do anything that's not just what it's already doing. It wants so to stay on Earth. <laughs> human body wants to stay on Earth so bad. And we like oxygen. Yes. Yeah. And kind but but, but, but the, to, to adapt gravity. for us to adapt, even the gravity field. Can we still have babies? Can we do all this kind of stuff and all these gravity fields? What do we do about our bone loss? And it's to the point. If you really want to go to the moon, good deal. Find people who want to go to the moon. When they come back to Earth, they're going to weigh six times as much. They're going to be floating in water, and that's it. So you leave the moon, when you leave to live on another world, you leave the Earth behind, and your body will adapt, and the whole species will adapt. But that's something no one thought about. When they show the little people on people exploring a Titan, they show them with spacesuits like Earth and looking like Earthlings. They are Earthlings. They don't realize that we are going to, if we want to be a spacefaring species, we're going to, the body is going to evolve. The body can't survive like it is now. You can't expect to come back. We are the heaviest gravity field in the solar system. Yeah, well, Jupiter's bigger and heavier. Yeah, but you can't land on it. It's all clouds. So the heaviest surface in the solar system is ours. So we have the best atmosphere. So basically, we go anywhere else, we're going to weigh a lot less. We wrote a planetarium show where we said, what would you do if you had fun on different planets? And we had them spelunking in Europa and bungee jumping on Eros and hang gliding on Titan, all kind of fun stuff. But these are people who are living there. They're not people who are coming back to Earth. And of course, uh, they, don't they don't depict that in science fiction, so no one's prepared for it. Vanessa, you, have a, you come from a uh, STEM tradition. Yes. Are people interested in aeronautics, in space flight? There are a couple that are very interested. Those that like do endeavor into looking into it are very passionate. I could talk to them for hours on aerospace. Um, but I don't think they cater towards aerospace um, during STEM field teaching. They mostly uh, do engineering. And so when I do meet mm. those aerospace or people that are interested in NASA or things like that, they're always worried about where am I going to go to college or are there programs for me that cater towards this because they're all based on engineering. Oh, so they're so practical. Yes. They're very practical. And yet, what Dr. Sumners was just talking about was pure science. Were you not talking about pure science? It's almost pure engineering. Pure it engineering. is almost engineering. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, one of the things about NASA, built in Clear Lake, um, the Manned Space Center at the time, where did all the people come from? All the people that were in that first generation of uh, engineers were Canadians because can Canada had the best engineering programs. And so we brought in a whole bunch of Canadians to Clear Lake to be the engineers because they were the ones who figured out how to get that moving object <laughs> from a moving object to another moving object. And without without actually being there. So it was engineering. And so whenever you say engineering, what, what is it that your fellow students, what do they uh, envision engineering as? I think it's like our chemical engineering. Okay. Or a petroleum engineering? Yes, the, like the engineering companies Electrical. here. Like, yes. I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's but very all practical. These, yeah, yeah and, but, saying, but all these practical. feed into space exploration yes. in a way. But, um, and here I, I, I'm, I'm betraying my past as a child of the 50s and 60s. Again, the romance, the adventure of Star Trek. Is there still an impact? Do you still, you know, astronauts were really cool. Yeah. They were the right <laughs> stuff. Yes. Does that still resonate? Or are astronauts just another group of people who live in the Clear Lake area and have children who go to Clear Lake High School who <laughs> tend to do very well at various engineering and mathematical competitions, but are nevertheless and not that extraordinary? They're becoming ordinary. I would say they are still extraordinary, but in an ordinary way. So we do look up to them like they are astronauts, um, but in some ways, it's like um, 
it's so accessible nowadays that it's, uh. it's, it's, oh, you can do this, but there's all this that you can do otherwise. It's too. just another job. Being an astronaut <clears throat> is just another job. Don't break my heart and say yes. No, I, 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 I definitely don't believe. I think being an astronaut takes a special type of person. But and very few people even get the opportunity because we have yes. very few astronauts. Yeah. I want, that was, that was one of the things that I wanted to be growing up. Mm -hmm. So when I was going to school, um, I was born in 66, so I guess I entered first grade in like six, 70, 71. My school principal, there were three of us, three kids, we played together and we played Star Trek. Not cowboys and Indians, we were playing Star <laughs> Trek. And uh, so the principal of the school had gotten a package of material from NASA. You know, all these moon, the pictures from the moon and whatnot, and he gave those to us, the three of us. And I had those, I probably, if you go through my parents' house, they're probably still there because I looked at those things. I wanted to be an astronaut, that was my, and then I found out you had to be in the military to be an astronaut, and that's when I changed. <laughs> Maybe not, uh, and also because uh, I'm not an, I'm not an engineer. But I mean, that's, isn't that what they learn a lot in? Um, that's one of the big yeah, fields the in the military academy. Yeah, I mean, it, this is as a lot of people I don't think realize that uh, the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy, uh, uh, West Point, the the military academy. Uh, science is at the core of everything they do. In fact, uh, when the United States Military Academy was founded in 1802, it was founded as an engineering school. In fact, it was the first engineering school in the United States. Uh, and so engineering and science and technology have always been at the core of what military officers uh, would learn at, at the academies. Uh, and what's interesting is it's only started changing in the 1980s where they started introducing more of a liberal arts education um, because there was a feeling that, that yes, these guys were good at engineering and good at very technical things, but how does that make you a good leader? I mean, how does knowing how to build a bridge make you a good leader of the people who will build the bridge? Uh, and so uh, it, it's, uh, it's starting in the 80s, they introduced more liberal arts, and starting in the 90s, you could actually major in something other than engineering for the first time. But that was almost 200 years into the, the United States Military Academy. Uh, and so the Army is always valued, and the, and the Air Force and Navy even more so have valued very technical education. If you want to go get a master's or a PhD in something technical, they'll support you, they'll try and find a way to pay for it. However, if you want to do anything in the humanities, you know, where, where Gene and I are, um, well, there's kind of an attitude that, well, what's a, what's a degree in history or political science? Go or read a book. Like. Yeah, go read a book <laughs> if you want to learn about that. That's not something we need. Uh, and so, so the, it's a real, there's a real, uh, there's a real debate within the military about education and the importance of education. But science and technology still remain, and especially, like I say, in the Navy and the Air Force, the core of what education is for them. Again, the military did advance so much of the science in the mid-20th yeah, century absolutely. and even before. Carolyn Sumners, how do you make science, aerospace science, astronomy, interesting? I'll tell you a second. To kids? I gotta tell my story first. Tell your story. Yes, they announced they were gonna take women on the space shuttle. Oh. At the Sally Ride was gonna get, you know, they were. So I was down at NASA doing a workshop at that very time. And I turned around and I said, okay, where's the astronaut office? And off I went and I said, there, I wanna go. <laughs> and they said, they looked at me and they said, what's your vision? <laughs> and I said, what's 2400? <laughs> and they said, you stay here. <laughs> And I was so depressed, but I remember going out, we were going to do a whole bunch of us, and I'll lead the pack of all these teachers and everybody, we're gonna go into space, this is so cool. So there has been a lot of enthusiasm for it. How do I make kids like it? Um, it doesn't seem like it's a very hard sell to me. Well, well, science is not, I, 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 I get the privilege of teaching every student in, the H, in HIST fourth grade, every single one. And we do a strong, we do the planetarium with them, we do solve puzzles, we figure out, we're trying to get them to do creative writing <coughs> about their planetarium experience. So we're focusing more on like the acrobatics on the moon and what it would be like to experience this or this or this uh -huh. and actually we create it. We have the highest resolution planetarium on earth. That's a plug. Um, <laughs> we do, we really do. And you really do, do your own your own sky shows. We do our own sky shows. We do produce some of our, we produce Tales of a Time Traveler, which is a really cool show with Doctor Who number 10. Uh, uh, telling it about travels through time. So we create our own shows too. And, but it's, it's amazing what we can do. And we're working this uh, this year for the first time and having clickers where kids will be able to drive a truck. May or may not work, it's not quite working yet, but it's getting close uh, on the moon. But at any rate, 
We try to tell everything in the way that they have to tell us what they learned. They have to help us figure these things out. Uh, we, most kids do not know why the sun rises and sets. They believe it's because we go around the sun, not because the earth turns. And then nobody knows why we have seasons because they believe we have seasons because we're close to the sun in summer, yeah. which is not right at all. Yeah. It's because the sun's high. Vanessa, does this show with your experience, this ignorance well, it, of planetary it, motion? Have you found that it, among your colleagues and friends? Yes, in some regards, yes, like the seasons, which you just said fascinated me because I have been under the impression that we were closer to the sun. Um, and I think that's just a lack of exposure because I do remember that fourth grade field this trip. This is a failure. I, and no, I remember that planetarium. This is a failure of the Do you remember the woman that taught you? No. I yeah, just I remember I was I was <laughs> I was, I was caught up with the uh, looking up at the stars. Oh, good, good. I'll take that. So right. I, I think as a kid, yes, everyone. I think everyone's drawn to being an astronaut or looking into space. And I think it's just like as we get older, that's where uh, different types of fields are, are encouraged and said. If you're good at math or if you're good at English, then you'll do better than if. You it's, it's where the jobs are. Yeah, exactly. It's where the the yeah, that's, prestige that's, that's is. That's where an the job honest is. thing to do. Yes. Yeah. And, and we, we use astronomy as a connector, but we also teach labs. And like today, I had the kids trying to make magnetic rings, you know, float, levitate magnetic rings, and then they had to uh, race cars. And we were experimenting with if you had extra mass, if you had it, whatever you would do to make the car go faster. Oh. And that's what, and the kids just probably spoke almost no English. And, and that's when you start learning that the more hands-on and the more victories the child has with the material, mm -hmm. the better off it is. And that's why we're working on clickers in the planetarium, so the kids actually help control the universe around them. Oh. Yeah, if it's, if it's all about, I think it's all, if it becomes all about numbers and mathematics, I think that's where you're going to lose a certain amount of children. I mean, that's certainly where I was lost. I didn't have that in primary school. I didn't have that uh, teachers, math teachers and science mm -hmm. teachers who made the, the, the fun aspects you're talking yeah. about. Uh, it was all about mathematics and it was all about numbers. And if you didn't automatically get the numbers real quick, you lost interest real quick. Uh, and, and, yeah. and unfortunately, that, I think that's part of the problem with science education is it's often so technical and at a young age. I know it has to be technical when you're getting a bachelor's in engineering, okay? Yeah. But w when you're in primary school, it sh there should be a fun aspect to it. And I think that's what's going to draw children in. Uh, and and that, I think that's one of our problems is it becomes so technical at a, such a young age that if you don't get the numbers real quick, if you're not somebody who that snaps in for real quick, Okay, I think I'm going to veer now toward more toward the humanities, toward those kind of which things. Which may be which a very good thing for the humanities. And then it it does. I'm going to ask a naughty question, but I know you'll answer honestly, Carolyn. We know, we know that Russia sent the first woman into space as a publicity stunt. Valentina Tereshkova, she was not prepared, she was a parachutist, she acquitted herself well, but she was chosen to be a woman so that the women of Russia would have a role model. Same thing with Sally Ride? No. Thank goodness, tell us why. Because it took a bunch of women. <laughs> she was the first of the crowd, but uh, Ray said and several others went with those first couple It was the right thing to do when she was eminently qualified. Oh. Please just tell me that, don't. A, so women, women, without <laughs> women are qualified, except, and, and the other thing, women are really qualified because you don't have to have strong legs in space. Legs are useless. So except for upper arm strength hoisting the Hubble telescope around, there's nothing in space that a woman can, can't do that a man can't do. They're, they're equal. And women are smaller. And when you have to send, when you're adding your little pounds up together to decide who you're going to fly, if you can get all the brains in something a little smaller package, it's a better deal. Yeah. So most of the control, and most of the controls, whether it just happens or not, most of the controls that you see in the back of the shuttle, you used to see where they land things and launch things and all. Tiny, itty bitty things. They were controlled by women. Uh -huh. Women have smaller hands as well. So I think the assets that women possess, plus women are a little bit sturdier, and I believe they have a little more gene, they have a little more genetic material, and so there. And uh, women are really quite well suited for space. There have been women who have spent extensive amounts of time in space. Yeah. And do they, they suffer more than men do when they return to Earth? <sighs> or tell us a little bit about the changes. You, you mentioned that earlier. It's, that it's, tricky, it's tricky stuff. 
Uh, I mean, they have to exercise two hours a day on the ISS if they want to come home. That's a lot of work. Now, it's better on the moon, because we haven't had to do that and bring people home except in 1970. Uh, but, uh, and we didn't stay very long. But for long, like a year in stay, space, you've really got to work out if you want to come home and be able to walk anytime soon. Because your body is so good at what it does. Your body adapts to whatever you do to it. Starve it, no problem. Anything you do, the body adapts to it. And that's what's happening in space. And it's how do we keep the calcium levels up? How do we keep the blood flowing the way we want it to? And uh, I think, I suspect, I don't know that to be a case. I shouldn't say that. I suspect that the women are doing definitely as well as the men in this area. But they had twins that went up, the Kellys. And the difference in the two was pretty much the same. But I haven't gotten good data on the telomeres yet because that was one of the things they were really worried about. That they actually, tell us what that is. Tell us it's it's the, end, is. the ends of your um, DNA in your cells, and it gets shorter. The telomeres get shorter as you get older, and that's one of the signs of aging. And so I, it's, it's one of the worrisome things about uh, getting older, as I say. So I think I don't think there's any reason women can't do as much in space. They, there are more women, there's as many women astronomers as men, I believe. It's very, very close. Women were pioneers in astronomy. Astronomy appeals to women. Um, it's, uh, it, it got more women in the field, even if they were just working as technicians to begin with. And then we get all the stories of what the discoveries they really made. But you're seeing, you see more and more women in, in, in astronomy and space science. It's just, it just naturally appeals. Well, and the other thing, too, we haven't touched on is um, uh, th there were women who were instrumental in the early years of the space program as well. And we talk about Goddard. His wife was actually uh, very much involved in his research but gets very little uh, of the press. But, you know, there was that movie recently, uh, Hidden, figure. Hidden Figures, talking about African-American women. But there were other women uh, involved as well. And we really pay little attention. I mean, uh, Hidden Figures... Great, fantastic movie, but part of the story. There's there's a much bigger story that really hasn't been explored. Uh, when I was working at the Johnson Space Center at the Oral History Program, there were a lot of women uh, who had been with the program uh, since uh, e e e you know even as far back as Mercury, and they their stories were just, you know many of them were engineers, many of them were doing math, many of them were doing other things. And so there's, a, there's another part of that story that really needs to be told just like hidden figures needed to be told. Uh, I was, uh, I remember when the first commander uh, of a space shuttle was a woman. Uh, and I was, uh, uh, she, uh, when she came back, and I can't recall her name offhand, uh, I got excited about hidden figures, but, um, <laughs> you know, when, when she came back, um, and they did the debriefing at the Johnson Space Center, and I was there, uh, and I met Rick Husband, who he had gone to tech, I was going to tech, and uh, so I got to have a good long conversation with him. Um, and, you know, of course, then a few years later, he was in Columbia. And um, I had, when we had watched uh, that ship, uh, I think, uh, 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 SPS-295 uh, take off where it was commanded by the first woman commander. Uh, and uh, the, the astronaut, if you, if you get to sit in mission control when that happens and watch it take off, there's an astronaut there assigned to mission control uh, to help the guests understand what's happening. And um, the uh, woman astronaut who was doing that uh, was also in Colombia and didn't make it back. So that was, you know, really kind of emotional for me because, uh, you know, that connection. Uh, but but I, we, we really don't tell the story about women astronauts or women in the space program, period, very well. And that's, that's something that somebody needs to do. We'll try to remedy some of that. In our last few minutes, I'm going to go around the table. Women's Equality Day, the year 2118. Do you think we'll be talking about STEM and space flight from the HMS TV studios on the moon or on Mars? Or do you think we're going to still be here on Earth? Gene, what do you think? I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, I like the way you phrase that. But uh, I think, look, 
the fact that we have two women who are involved in STEM fields right now and learning and, and practicing, uh, 50 years ago when we were at the moon, that wouldn't have happened. It was seen as a men's uh, Provence, and so. Gives you courage. Yeah, so, I mean. Uh, uh, who knows? Yeah, who knows? who knows? Who knows? Vanessa, 2118, are we going to be sitting here on Earth, or are we going to be on the moon or Mars, or maybe Europa? I would even want farther than Europa, you know? I would absolutely <laughs> believe that <laughs> women's equality could be celebrated anywhere in space, you know, with the advances that we're making, so I would sure hope so, looking on to the future that. Alex? Will well, the, the generals and colonels of 2021, <laughs> 18? I have, I, have I have six and seven year old daughters at yeah. home and I have uh, no fear whatsoever that they can do anything they want, uh, that they can be anything they want. My, my older daughter is already convinced she can do anything she wants <laughs> at seven. Uh, but I, I think, th th again, I, I don't see anything in education. You know, Gene and I are in higher ed. I, I don't see anything that's going to hold them back and that they're going to be able to accomplish and do whatever they want. Well, we as a nation have the will. I think we have the expertise. I don't think there's anyone at this table who would disagree. I, I think but I, would we have the will to go ahead and do, as President Kennedy said, these wondrous things? Well, or again, the, the, involving the private sector, as has now become the thing, I think is really going to push a lot. And there will be women sure. and men together. Carolyn? In December of 1985, we flew, we were in the planetarium teaching the astronauts of um, Challenger how to find Halley's Comet. And they died in Jan at the end of January. And so we created the Challenger Learning Center, which now I call the Expedition Center, to take, not to take kids to the moon and Mars, but to show them the team problem solving that is required to go into space or anything else. And I think that's probably the real lesson of the space program is that people can work together and you can do a team. And we fly a lot of kids every year. And there are as many boys as girls in these groups and they embrace the missions just as much. So I see the future is very bright. The best of the earth. Yes. Well, no, these, these are, these are, you know, we, we, we fly inner city kids. We fly all kinds of kids because we get all kinds of money to fly all kinds of kids and all the kind of kids like it. Some of them don't enunciate as well, but they problem solve as well. And they work together sometimes even better. Thank you. Jean Preuss, Carolyn Sumners, Alexander Bielakowski, and Vanessa Perez, thank you so much for joining us this evening as we pondered and went on a bit of a conversational journey to the stars. I'm going to take just a moment to remind voters that the November elections are just around the corner. And as always, the League of Women Voters is here to help with information on the election process and on the candidates. Our voters guide will be ready in the middle of October, nonpartisan, impartial information so you can read about the candidates and figure out which candidates' views align most closely with your own. Visit our website, www.lwvhouston.org, for lots of good information. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Take good care. We'll chat again soon.